So today I've got a fairly interesting turn for us to talk about. We've had our first important battle against another player, we've had a terrible event, we've had a very good event, and we've had the surprising message that Aurelian Rex Ermor, god of Scleria, has been permanently vanquished. Behind the scenes, some kind of coalition against Scalaria has been slowly whittling him away to nothing this entire time. Which makes sense, that's what usually happens to Scalaria, because if they get going they will roll over the entire game. Unfortunately, that means that there hasn't really been any attention paid to Pangaea, who will also steamroll the game if they are allowed to just get on with their own their own deal quietly. So let's run through these quickly, and then we will have a look at this battle. First off, we had the unlucky event that a vampire count has invaded. This is one of the various neutral invasions that can occur, where there is an uprising and a group take control of one of your provinces, turning it back into a neutral province. Irritating, to say the least. The good event we've had is that our first hero has arrived. There's a mechanic in the game where every nation has a handful of pre-designed heroes, which are especially powerful versions of their commander units. They all have their own little backstories as well, which is nice, a cute little detail. But so this is incredibly useful because this means that we now have an air caster, a path that we previously only had access to on our god. So interestingly, Uruk did not elect to wait until I until I dragged him kicking and screaming out of his out of his shell like some kind of doomed bivalve on the plate of the nouveau riche. As you can see, he lost pretty much everything. His only survivor is his god. It might look like I took pretty heavy losses, but in fact, I did not. The vast majority of my actual losses were on my wolf riders, who move so fast that they're very difficult not to script to be involved in a battle. In fact, I probably should have specifically sent them somewhere else so as to not be involved. As we will see in a moment when we view this battle, they did just run out in front and get themselves slaughtered. Almost all of the rest of these kills are on summoned undead including 50 that his god wiped out somehow. We'll have to keep an eye on that when we look at the battle itself. So here we have the early setup phase. His archers are actually able to reach us, which is surprising. We cast our spells, they cast their spells, everybody gets set up for a big war in the middle. Which is pretty much how ancient world warfare would actually go. Now that the relief is up and our other spells start coming out, they should be starting to gain a lot of fatigue every turn, and we should be gaining a lot less fatigue thanks to the relief, which I love the visual effect of that. It's time for Skeleton Rave. Nts, 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 nts. Anyway, as you can see, the Wolf Riders have already got themselves killed, but they still served a valuable purpose in slowing down the rest of these units. The first trickle of skeletons heading in as the, uh, well, this guy doesn't have much fatigue, but um, as the rest of the fatigue starts to build up, they're already at 50% fatigue. You fall asleep at 100 fatigue and start taking damage at 200 fatigue, so. He's also cast Swarm, which is entertaining, although I don't believe any of these creatures actually get far enough to do any, any serious problems. His god's in here somewhere, I think. If he's not, then I don't know where he is. So as you can see, this runs like absolute garbage. As the uh, skeletons start to really, really pitch in. Let's have a look and see how they're doing on fatigue. They've begun to fall asleep. So as all of these guys pass out on the battlefield, it is time for what we could really only describe as the Ancient World's Combine Harvester. Which would be more accurately described as an absolute shit ton of skeletons marching their way across the battlefield, very slowly stabbing all of these sleeping people to death. Which sucks for them, but is good for me. This takes a while. Unfortunately, because these are not permanent undead and will disappear at the end of the combat, I have no idea exactly how many we summoned, but my god, it's a lot. Both sides of the battlefield are asleep now, his and mine, including all of his spellcasters, who soon enough will start taking damage just from the fatigue. This guy's still in. This guy's still around, astonishingly. I'm going to keep an eye on him. I want to know what happens. He 
He is casting Ashes to Ashes, which is a potent... Ashes to Ashes is his... Oh, where did he go? I missed it. Oh, no. He got away, and I didn't even see how it happened. Maybe he routed and fled? That is entirely possible. Or possibly he had already cast a spell like Returning, which would take him back to his home. I'm getting a bit tired of this right now. It is a very effective battlefield tactic, but not exactly a time efficient one. That's got to be at least two, three hundred undead we've summoned so far. <laughs> and as you can see, they are doing all of the work. Just the lag as the game desperately tries to render all of these units. You wouldn't think something that uses 2D sprites would have such a, a hard time rendering on a modern processor. And there it is, finally, at last, we have defeated them. So, his attempt to uh, charge outside means that his fortress now basically has one thing in it, probably, which is his Akpalu, which... That's definitely his god, right? That looks that super looks like it's his god. But possibly... Actually, I, you know what? We can just check. We can literally just look this up. We can go to statistics, pretenders of the world, and then find garbage pretender I choose you. I don't see Akpalu in this list anywhere. So yeah, that must be his deity, which means that next turn we'll go inside and scrape him out and, and, and then live inside his capital like some kind of parasitic entity. So that means there's a few things I need to talk about. I've refreshed these guys ready for their battle next turn, and um, they shouldn't have any trouble killing what's left in this castle and taking it. However, Pangaea is almost certainly going to launch an attack on me on turn 34, and we are on turn 32, so I'm going to have to very quickly fortify myself up in this area and try and fend him off. This army is probably going to sit here until then and then jump in. With a bit of luck and enough battlefield spells, we should be able to beat him, especially considering we now have access to Howl, which will summon infinite wolves across the course of the battle. Those wolves will also fall asleep. However, when they enter the battlefield, they start at, you know, zero fatigue, which means that it'll take them a little while to fall asleep. I should note that it is actually possible to perform a siege, to perform a fatigue play self-own, where it takes so long for the skeletons to kill all of the opponents on the battlefield that eventually the game timer runs out. If you hit a, if you hit a certain turn number, the attackers will start to flee, and if you hit an additional turn number, the defenders will start to flee. And if you hit, I believe, turn 150 of a battle, then instantaneously everything left on the battlefield is immediately deleted. I'm not sure what the in-world in theming for this event is, but um, we want to try and avoid that. And a whole bunch of asleep wolves on the battlefield will make it harder for our skeletons to reach our opponents and stab them to death. We also got a few useful items, including one very useful one. We have picked up off the battlefield a enormous cauldron of broth, which increases the supply bonus in whatever province that commander is in by 100. It is a very useful item, and I've actually been thinking about forging some of my own, just to prevent starvation and the damage that causes while your troops are marching around through potentially low-value provinces on their way to somewhere more important. So, let's take a look at that new hero. Gulvig has a unique backstory, unlike all of the rest of the Giga, and a unique sprite, just like all of the other heroes who have unique stories and sprites. However, she's incredibly powerful. She's a really good hero. Not only does she have magic paths we don't otherwise have access to, including air, which is just great, and a high level on all of these different paths, this puts her directly in second place behind my god in terms of magical power. She also has glamour, which means that she has a mirror image spell automatically cast on her in battle so that she looks like she's five people and you have to hit the real her to damage her. She also has a supply bonus, which might come from her high level, na high level nature magic because yet another one of the mechanics in this game is that if your paths are high enough, you gain certain bonuses. On top of all of that, she's poison resistant and immortal and fire resistant, which is especially useful, but the immortality is the main thing because that means that if she dies, she will respawn in my capital three months later. In addition to all of that, she enables us to cast a very effective battlefield spell, which is going, which is why we're going to switch from Thaumaturgy to Evocation. 
Thaumaturgy we had switched to researching in order to get with a bones, a very effective anti-undead spell, both because of this particular throne that we want to take, but also because uh, Scalaria down here is a heavily undead-themed nation, and I thought for sure we'd be fighting them later. Since they won't be around, it's not worth getting that research just to take this throne. I should attack it with a uh, just ordinary communions and troops and try and take it fairly soon in some other way. Which means we're switching to evocation, because when we get to evo 6, what do we get? We get Wailing Winds. It's relatively expensive, two death gems to cast, but this is an extremely effective battlefield enchantment. This, with an ordinary army, will t just win the battle by itself. Combined with the other stuff I'm doing in my armies, this is kind of a win button. And if necessary, it can even be used similarly to the way that Foul Vapors can be used as a kind of like a, a dedicated army removal strike force. It essentially forces every creature on the battlefield to make really common morale checks or flee. If you cast that at the start of the battle, halfway through the battle, half of the enemy will already have turned and fled the battlefield. Unless you also are making them fall asleep, which... Those tactics don't necessarily synergize super well, but it does prevent a number of their units from being involved in the battle before they fall asleep. So that's all going to be extremely useful against this dipshit's army of centaurs. And finally, or rather penultimately, I am forging a bunch of equipment to put on a scratty, thru th a scratty thrug a Scrati Thug, in order to take this province back from the vampires. Vampires are pretty tough, but I think I have a I think I have a build that will deal with them. I'm going to be giving one of my Scrati a charcoal shield, which gives him the fire shield ability, which means that he should be reasonably well protected. I'm also giving him some extra armor, and I'm also giving him a sort of sharpness, which will give him two attacks and a little, little defense bonus. The vampires can all fly and have invulnerability, but no protection. The magic damage from his sword should cut through the invulnerability, and he'll hit easily since they have no protection. And in addition, there's a lot of them and they fly to the rear, which means that if I can kill their captain vampire, all of the rest of everything else on the battlefield will either flee or disappear, depending on whether it's undead or mind-controlled humans. So with a bit of luck, I should be able to get that working next turn. Beyond that, I do need to continue planning for this, this eventual battle, which is going to be difficult to win. On the other hand, if I can wipe out a shit ton of his centaurs, the gold swing involved is monumental. He can only get white centaurs in his capital, which is some... which is here. <laughs> and... Um, they are quite expensive. They are his most important unit. He churns them out en masse for the entire game. So losing like a couple hundred of them is actually kind of disastrous for him. But they are powerful enough that there's no guarantee we will be able to just get rid of them all. That brings me to something which I haven't really talked about, which is the final thing I'm going to talk about this turn, which is the mental load of this game and the fatigue it provokes. When I started this series, I thought I might just keep playing this game basically forever as a hobby, the way that many of the players of this game do. But as we've moved into the mid game, I've realized that that would be a huge mistake. I love this game. I love the idea of this game. I love the theming of this game. And I really, really think the mechanics are fascinating and deep in a way that almost no games are. I can see why this game has such a, such a strong multiplayer community. But the stress and fatigue of having to complete one of these turns every day having to remember everything that's going on in all tiny parts of my empire, having to script individual wizards to cast different arrays of spells in different combats, having to figure out the tactical benefits of moving wizards from one place to another place, or sneaking something around the back, or any number of other relatively small-seeming things, massively add up as the turns get much more complex. It can take me an hour to complete a turn at the moment, and having to do that under this quite high pressure, high stakes situation, because you do get really invested, you want to win, which means that you have to spend that time and all that mental energy on successful scripting. And then the morale hit of when you try really hard and fail anyway is, is pretty bad. <laughs> anyway, that is all for today. Let's see what happens tomorrow. Well, we've got another kind of a no-show of a turn, not a great deal of stuff to say, except that we killed Uruk's god. So that sucks for him, I guess. Although he's not quite out of the game yet. He has one and only one territory left, as far as I can tell. Nothing in it, but he has it. Other than that, we've got some unexpected events. A little bit of good luck, a little bit of bad luck. More bad luck. And we've got a couple of worldwide events. One's going to make enchantment rituals cheaper, but we won't be doing any. And the other is that growth is now spreading across the world, which won't matter to us because we took growth scales three anyway. Another throne has been claimed. I'm starting to get a little bit antsy. 
I really want to grab these two thrones before it's too late, but I don't know if I can retask an army when I'm about to have war with Pangaea, probably. I should probably talk to Man about settling this as a as a border and see if, see if he's okay with that. But yeah, there's not much to say today. We have successfully taken Aruk's capital and I've switched everybody there to start researching. Except this guy who I'm going to send back to the capital in exchange for this guy. My Scrati start with two water, two blood, and then they get one random of blood, water, nature, or death. The most useful of the piles I have access to is always death. So sending this one who just spawned in and has death magic is going to be more advantageous to me than having this guy who has water magic. Since if I'm plugging him in to cast Grip of Winter, it doesn't need to be a water mage to do that because the communion will give enough bonus levels that it can be done anyway. And this way, he can start casting Skeleton Spam afterwards and make use of himself rather than just standing around like a great big lemon. Does, does Jotunheim have lemons? Do these guys know what lemons are? Maybe that's why we've uh, established this great war to the north. We're trying to get as far north as we can so that we can get some hot water. Um, and use them to grow lemons? That's not how that works. Anyway, I've re-equipped everybody here ready to go to war if they need to, but they aren't going to unless they have to. There's either one or two turns more before hostile things will start happening. And uh, Pangaea has declined to clarify that for me. I'm not sure what the etiquette of an, of an NAP is in this situation. But regardless, they can step out and take this probably pretty easily. What I'm worried about is this. He's taken his army with the white centaurs. In fact, I don't think he's left any white centaurs here. Which means that this is just chaff to hold the fortress for as long as possible. Uh, all of those white centaurs are coming south. Which means he's probably going to come through here and try and just slap my capital down. That probably won't be a problem. I should have enough Scrati to do a Turbo Communion by then, and if not, I've got just so many, so many Gigias. You know, if he reaches this province or this province, I'll just have a bunch of Gigias move from here or from here into the capital in one turn, and then they can contribute that way. And then I'll step out from the capital and slap him down with just so many, so many skeletons, more skeletons than you would, you would think was really feasible, but um, nevertheless, that many skeletons. The frustrating thing about that is that depending on how the timing works out, he might kill this guy before he finishes building that castle, which will be 600 gold down the toilet. Other than that, there's just more logistics as I shuffle troops around. There's one other thing that I want to mention, actually, which is that I am now recruiting a fuck ton of, uh, of just ordinary Veti spear goblins for a little tactic, which I don't think has a name, but which will come in very handy for supporting my turbo communions against the white centaurs. The risk with the white centaurs is that they push through my front line before I can get a critical mass of skeletons going, which means that they can then get in amongst the spellcasters, disrupt the spellcasting, kill the spellcasters before the zombie horde really starts shambling snowball-like down the cliff at them. And um, that'll be the end for the stack, because white centaurs properly, bl properly blessed are really tough. So what do I need? Well, I need chaff. What's the purpose of chaff? Chaff slows down your opponent because they have to stop to kill it. What are some really useful things to do with chaff? Well, if you happen to have access to cheap Astral One spellcasters that you're not using for anything else, you can have them cast, you can have them spam two spells in this particular tree. They can cast Cheat Fate and they can cast Luck. These AoEs will both hit one single tile, which normally isn't very much, but you've got to consider that the Veti are small enough that six of them can fit in one tile. So if I, if I have several Veti Hags spamming those two spells, then suddenly all of the first strikes against a ton of the Veti in the big block of infantry will be negated. So it'll take twice as long to kill them. But then in addition, the other spell will just mean that they have something like a 25% mischance, which means that on top of that, a lot of their... Which means that on top of that, a lot of their attacks are going to miss as well. Which means that suddenly you have these very, very hard to hit goblins, which means... That while half the chaff will just fucking die instantaneously, the other half will become an enormous tar pit that will be a huge pain in the ass and very difficult to remove from the battlefield, which should eat up most of the charge, which then means that having a defensive line of giant infantry at the back of the battlefield in just only protecting my casters, my other casters, should be able to catch the rest of the white centaurs and hold them off long enough for the hordes to happen. And fortunately, my Veti spearmen are so cheap that I can just get an absolute ton of them every turn, which means I can prep to have a huge block of them occupy this guy very quickly, and then it'll be time for him to go to sleep and be murdered. 
I'm sure I'm forgetting something, but I think that's all we need to talk about today. If you enjoyed this, please like, subscribe and share. I also stream regularly on Twitch, and you can find me on Twitter for updates and announcements. If you want to contribute to my continued existence, then why not donate to me on Coffee or Patreon? All of the links are in the description. Thank you so much for watching.